Teeth. We all have them and we all hate them. These good for nothing little Tic Tacs just hang out in our mouths, waiting for the chance to betray us at any turn. You know, most of a skeleton has the decency to hide itself under flesh, but not the teeth. They're all, I deserve to be on display, baby. For better or worse, here I am. And because of their insistence that they deserve to exist, we've been forced to invent dentistry. But it wasn't a nice invention pathway. It was a pathway full of pain, suffering, and an ever-present lie about worms causing all tooth-related problems. So let's get started. Thousands of years ago, when we were all hunter-gatherers, the big tooth problem wasn't cavities, it was extreme wear. It was actually super common for your teeth to be completely worn down at the end of life, exposing the pulp or the innermost softest layer, which, ouch. This was because hunter-gatherer diets were full of super fibrous food, as well as mash with bone flakes in it that wore down the teeth over time. Our teeth actually got very few cavities as hunter-gatherers. Their diets just weren't heavy in carbohydrates and refined sugar, which is what makes cavities thrive. That problem began, as many of our problems did, when we decided that it was too annoying to look for food every day, so we started building farms, then more elaborate civilizations. And as soon as our diets changed, the cavities started. And the richer you were, the more sweets and breads you were getting, so the worse your teeth got. The earliest cavities found in mummies start around 2500 BC, and historians can literally track the rise in the Egyptian luxury class by observing the decline in their teeth. So all around the world, these early civilizations started facing the collective headache of toothaches. And in case you weren't aware, toothaches feel really, really bad. 30 to 40% of all of your motor and sensory nerves are in your face and mouth. People regularly say that tooth pain is the worst pain they've ever experienced in their entire life. Some even say it's worse than childbirth. And this combination of some of the worst pain imaginable being experienced by people in societies that are thousands of years away from having any meaningful medicine or any way to dull the pain led to hopelessness. And humans, we don't do well with hopelessness. In fact, we can't stand it even for a minute. We'd rather be lied to or lie to ourselves. Plus, it's not very good for business because if you're in an ancient culture and you're a healer and someone comes to you looking for healing, well, you better offer up some healing or your customers won't be coming back. So instead of offering the truth and saying, um, hey, so sorry, but I actually have no idea what's wrong with your tooth, and by the way, neither does anyone else on the planet, and also there is no hope in sight for the next 4,000 years, but your 200th great-granddaughter might if she has insurance. B came up with a lie. So what did this myth slash lie end up being? What completely detached from reality story did these early humans tell themselves because to stare into the gulf of the unknown was just too scary and ego crushing? Well, that it's all the toothworm's fault, of course. When you have no concept of a germ, blame it all on the toothworm. Toothworms, patent pending. So what's a toothworm? First and foremostly, nothing. No toothworm has ever existed. Therefore, toothworms have not ever been the cause of any tooth problems. But if you were to ask someone in ancient times what a toothworm was, they would have told you that toothworms were the cause of every toothache and every tooth problem. And maybe you're thinking that they were talking about maggots, you know, somehow maggots were getting into these old, tiny, fucked up mouths. No. They mean a toothworm, a worm living inside the tooth. Very conveniently, if you ask me, because then you have a built-in excuse as to why you never see it. The most famous reference to toothworms is in a Babylonian cuneiform tablet titled The Legend of the Worm. And I just, I fucking love this story. After Anu had created heaven, heaven had created the earth. 
The earth had created the rivers. The rivers had created the canals. The canals had created the marsh. And the marsh had created the worm. The worm went weeping before Shumash, his tears flowing before Yah. What wilt thou give me for my food? What wilt thou give me for my sake? I shall give thee the ripe fig and the apricot. Of what use are they to me, the ripe fig and the apricot? Lift me up, and among the teeth and the gums cause me to dwell. The blood of the tooth I will suck, and of the gum I will gnaw its roots. Like, first of all, this worm had some fucking balls. Like, you're a worm, and you think you have the right to just walk up to some gods and demand some shit? And then when those gods are like, uh, bro, I literally made the ripe fig and the apricot for you? You're like, no, bitch, I don't give one fuck about the ripe fig and the apricot. The ripe fig and the apricot can go fuck off for all I care. You know what I do want though, God? I want blood and gum from the disgusting mouth of a human. And then, apparently, the worm gets what it wants. Like, is this worm just a really good negotiator? Should I be asking for raises like this toothworm asks for blood? Hashtag toothworm goals, hashtag times up apricot. Anyway, like, sure, I kind of get it. You know, worms are related to decay and tooth decay feels samey as that. So why not believe in the toothworms? But what really got me was not that some early humans believed in the tooth worm, but just how pervasive this lie slash myth was for so many thousands of years. The Babylonians, the ancient Chinese and Hindu cultures, the ancient Egyptians, ancient Romans and ancient Greeks, and many more cultures all believed in the tooth worm. Thousands of years after those Babylonian tablets were written, the myth was still alive and well, making it into Decomposition Medica Mentorum, the first list of medicines the Western world published in 41 AD, and still for thousands of years after that. In fact, every early civilization believed that toothaches were caused by either tooth worms, tooth demons, or humors, the four fluids that ancient medicine thought controlled our health. And I'm sure that the concept of the tooth worm must have been invented by multiple people, but also the idea must have spread, which means it must have really felt compelling to all those ancient people. Like once you're out there on a journey and you hear about the tooth worm, you're just ready to bring it home and start telling your budding civilization. And all those citizens are ready to listen. So what did you do when you had tooth worms? Well, one thing you could do was to recite that tooth worm poem, or you could pray, or you could smoke the worms out by putting henbane seeds in beeswax, then heating the mixture up on an iron and funneling the resulting smoke into your mouth. This treatment was thought to prove the existence of tooth worms because the ash of burned henbane seeds looks like worms. There were also a ton of other remedies that people tried, mostly the involve, you know, making a mixture of herbs that may or may not relieve pain and jamming said mixture into your teeth and mouth. These early attempts at figuring out what was wrong with teeth are such an interesting study in how human societies learn, how they start to identify problems, and of course, how they start to realize that religion is all lies. We think of the separation of religion and science as innate, but it's really pretty new just because even understanding what science is, is so new. Back in these ancient cultures, if you were trying to figure out anything about life, you just had religion. But religion wasn't, you know, what religion is like today. It was everything. It was most of society. It was straddling this weird line of reciting doctrine while also innovating because so much of the time, the religious leader of the community was also the medical expert of the community. And some religious leaders started to figure out that they needed to do what we would call science. In what is probably the most interesting example of religion and science intermingling that I've ever seen, the ancient Babylonians would track their prayers. So if you got sick, you would pray to get better. 
and you'd also take whatever medicine was recommended. This was just part of doing what you had to. It wasn't pray, but take no action. Then, if you were covered, your prayer was considered answered, and you would go to the temple and write down on a clay tablet what treatment cured you. Priests would then make collection of the most important tablets or the types of prayers that always got answered, and it's argued that these tablet collections are some of the world's first medical textbooks created entirely by the church as a collection of answered prayers. Here are a few examples of what the tablets said about teeth. If his teeth are dark colored, the disease will last a long time. If his teeth are crowded together, he will die. If his teeth fall out, his house will collapse. <laughs> Look, I said it was one of the world's first medical textbooks. I didn't say it was one of our first good textbooks. <laughs> and over the next few thousand years, the separation between church and tooth continued, although not without bumps on the road or worms in the teeth, if you will. By 460 BC, Hippocrates was born, and he marks Western civilization's first steps towards technological secularization because he publicly stated that magic and religion should be separated from medicine. He believed in the humoral theory, that's the one I mentioned earlier, where everything is determined by the four fluids of the body, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile which may not be modern medicine, but was way closer than imaginary worms. This led to medical shops popping up in ancient Greece, which started to replace the temples as the go-to location for illnesses. Each medical shop had a specialty, so one of them was probably the very first dentist office in the West. So let's say you're a citizen of ancient Greece or even later on in ancient Rome when they had two different dental specialties and you needed to go to the dentist. First of all, depending on your problem, you would go to either a tooth drawer or a barber surgeon. Tooth drawers specialized in extracting teeth, so if you were in pain, that's where you'd go. You'd undergo an extremely dangerous procedure where your tooth was pulled. You had a high likelihood of becoming extremely ill or dying because of infection after the removal. You had no real anesthetic, just things like henbane smoke to dull the pain, and that was that. On the other hand, if you had a non-toothache problem, you'd visit the barber surgeons who were all about bloodletting, leaching, cupping, and shaving down the teeth so they look pretty. As for home tooth care, well, you probably had access to toothpicks. We've found toothpick use as far back as Neanderthal skulls. And over the centuries, we've found societies with toothpicks made of feather quills, metals, straw, and of course, all sorts of sticks and wood. Toothbrushes as we think of them didn't exist yet, but Hippocrates had a DIY solution that sounds like something you'd pay $20 for at brunch now. He recommended getting a small ball of wool, dipping it in honey, kind of smashing it around your teeth like a toothbrush, and then after cleaning, rinsing with dill, aniseed, myrrh, and white wine. The Shushrita Samhita, an ancient Sanskrit text, recommends that you rise early in the morning and brush one's teeth with a fresh twig of a tree, free from any knots, 12 fingers in length, and as thick as one small finger. And before we move on from ancient dentistry, I have to mention a few highlights I just found really interesting. One, even though Hippocrates was so smart and so important by saying that magic and medicine should be separated, you can really get a sense of how dumb everyone back in the day was because he, along with Aristotle and basically every other Roman and Greek academic mind, just knew that women had less teeth than men. This was considered an official fact like grass is green and they both wrote about it in their medical writings. And this should really go without saying, but no we don't. Why did they think that? Who knows, but it shows you the level of follow through and understanding of any scientific process they had, including not looking into mouths. <laughs> they must've just been like, hey, look over there at that dumb woman. Did you know they don't even have as many teeth as us? Makes sense to me. How'd you figure that out? By knowing it in my heart. Of course! I'll go ahead and put it in the official records for thousands of years. And two, hold on to your butts and get ready for the story of the relic of the tooth of the Buddha, 
the most sought after tooth in all of history. Legend has it that when the Buddha died in 543 BC, his body was cremated in a sandalwood pyre in Northeast India, but not before his left canine tooth was retrieved from the funeral pyre by his disciple Kima. Kima then traveled to the southeastern coastal kingdom of Kalinga and gave it to King Brahmadatam, who despite being Hindu, accepted the tooth for veneration. It stayed in the capital of Kalinga, a city still around today named Dantapuram that translates to, you guessed it, Tooth City for over 800 years. And that's the last time the tooth had peace because the tooth started to get a reputation that anyone in possession of the tooth had an innate right to rule the land. And in the fourth century, King Gushiva, a neighboring king close to Tooth City was like, why are all these people worshiping the tooth and why don't I have it? So he visited it and he was so amazed that he converted to Buddhism and immediately started persecuting Hindus you know, the religion he was until like a few months before he started persecuting them. Needless to say, persecuting Hindus didn't go so well with other neighboring Hindu kings, and neighboring King Pandu decided that he was going to end it once and for all by stealing and destroying the teeth. Hint hint, that didn't go well. Apparently, he was also so impressed with the tooth that once he saw it, he also became Buddhist and so did his entire army that he had taken to Tooth City to destroy the tooth. And here's where it gets even more legendy. Apparently, King Pandu, even though him and his whole army were Buddhist now, still ordered the tooth to be thrown into a fire pit, and it was, but upon throwing the tooth into the fire, a lotus flower the size of a chariot wheel arose above the flames, and the sacred tooth emitting rays which ascended through the skies and illuminated the universe alighted on the top. At least, that's what Jose Garcin de Cuna wrote in his 1875 memoir on the history of the tooth relic of Ceylon. Apparently, eventually King Pandu accepted that the tooth needed to be worshipped, but the tooth was too hot at that point. Too many kings were like, what the fuck is this tooth and why don't I have it? More and more attackers came until 360 AD, and for those of you keeping track at home, we're about 900 years after the death of the Buddha at this point, when the princess of Kalinga, Karubaki, smuggled the tooth out of India and into Sri Lanka, stashing it in her hair to get it out of the city. King Mahasena of Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, accepted the tooth graciously, and the tooth is still in the mountainous capital of Kandy today. And if you think that's the end of the tooth story, boy are you wrong. In 1560, Portuguese colonizers attacked and captured the Kingdom of Kandy and stole the tooth, even though the king of then Burma, now Myanmar, offered the Portuguese 50,000 pounds for the tooth, they said no and decided to destroy it instead. You know, because it was the Inquisition and people are jerks and they wanted everyone to convert to Christianity. So in a very public ceremony with the Viceroy and Portuguese court present, the Archbishop of Goa publicly pounded the tooth to smithereens with a mortar and pestle and scattered the remains into the sea, completely destroying the relic. And if you think that's the end of the tooth story, boy are you wrong! The Khan or military leader, Wikrama Ahu, was like, fuck that, and immediately commissioned a replacement tooth to be manufactured. They got a piece of tooth-colored ivory and carved it 20 times the size of a normal tooth and then built the palace that it still lives in today. The fact that the original tooth was destroyed had essentially zero effect on how seriously people took the tooth or how frequently they came to visit it. The last time the tooth saw violence was in 1998 when Tamil rebel forces that were in conflict with the Sri Lankan government attacked the Temple of the Tooth with three suicide bombers killing 11 people. Today you can visit the tooth, or at least the huge ivory replica, which now has its own legend for people unfamiliar with its history. This tooth's legend is that it's that large because it's been slowly growing since the Buddha's death almost 3,000 years ago. The tooth is still in the temple of the tooth in Kandy, Sri Lanka, and the Kandy Laha Paraha, also known as the Festival of the Tooth, is a festival in August and September where the tooth is taken from its temple and marched through the streets by a 100 elephant parade at night under a full moon. And that's the end of the two story. For now. Okay, so back to Western culture, and I do apologize for how Western culture heavy the rest of this video is going to be, and I will mention the non-Western tidbits I found. Let's check in after the fall of Rome. That era of relative science and reason was over, and we were about to enter a thousand years of, well, garbage. 
In the general Middle Ages from the 5th century to the 15th century, we are in the throes of a bunch of grim shit like the plague, the crusades, and generally not having enough technology to make any progress on a lot of problems, including the entire dental arena. And if you're wondering, it's this far back, all the way back to medieval times when the split between dentistry and other medicine begins. So when you're paying that extra premium for dental every month, or you know, not paying it at all because you need to save money and dental insurance generally does nothing, blame the Middle Ages. And to set the stage, to really get our minds focused on medieval dentistry, let's go back to our old chestnut, hopelessness. Just like their early human counterparts, everyone I'm about to talk about lived their entire lifetimes hundreds of years away from any dental solutions. There was no hope in sight, no glimmer of light for any of them at all. Just try to imagine it for a second. There's no hospital, there's no running water, there's no electricity, there's no Rick and Morty, there's nothing. All you have is the earliest, most rudimentary whiffs of tinctures, solves, and some other mediocre options that heal some of the things some of the time. Your entire medical fate is really running on a hope and a prayer. And speaking of hopes and prayers, we are fully back to religion and medicine being intertwined. First at the Vatican and then throughout Europe, priests performed the roles of bleeding and surgery. Bleeding was, you know, that thing old timey people just wouldn't stop doing for hundreds of years where they thought cutting you open and letting you bleed out some of your blood was regulating your body. And surgery was, you know, scary old timey surgery with no anesthetic. So basically, need your leg sawed off? Priest. Have a toothache? Priest. Feeling generally out of balance and need to go drip a bunch of your blood into a bowl? You guessed it. Priest. Then the palpal decree of 1092 comes out and it says monks have to be shaved and they can either go for certain approved styles or cut it all off. This means, all of a sudden, the church needs a lot of barbers. The barbers started intermingling with the priests and assisting them on medical procedures, and pretty soon they're starting to be called things like barber and blood removers. Over this time, the church began to look down on priests doing all this medical work, and in 1163, the Pope banned monks from doing any work which would shed blood. Why? I don't know, something about it being incompatible with the divine mission, but it was great news for all the barbers because it exploded their business. All of these previous assistants were now the head bitches in charge of horrifying medical procedures, in addition to the sweet haircuts they had already been giving. And you know what made the deal even sweeter? It was recommended that every monk get bled up to five times a year. Now that's some MLM inspired customer retention shit. And this is where the split between dentistry and the rest of medicine starts. Because all of these assistants, the barbers that took over the medical roles, they were now in charge of teeth pulling. And even for back in the day, they weren't considered educated medical professionals. They were considered tradesmen with a little training, but you know, not any super specialized skills. They were also in charge of surgery, but remember that without anesthetic, surgery really isn't that much of a science. It's more of a serial killer's wet dream, so you don't really need a professional to do it. Doctors at the time would not perform any dental treatments or procedures, largely because they didn't have anything helpful or non-barbaric to offer. So if you wanted someone to look at your teeth, you had to go to the guy who was willing to look at your teeth. And it turns out that that's the guy that cuts your hair. <laughs> and we'll get into this later, but there were a few different job titles that you could have in this situation. Surgeon barbers, the very different barber surgeons, and of course, just regular old barbers. So what do you get when you combine a medical profession in its infancy that refuses to do any work on teeth, a church that's doing less and less work in this area, and a bunch of barely trained assistants with, remember, no actual hope or solutions or real medicine in a society increasingly pained by horrible tooth problems because of the continual addition of refined sugar to diets. You guessed it, con artists. Hooray! Wow, con artists 
artists today would dream of the opportunities they had in medieval Europe. You could get away with anything, and that anything usually meant killing a lot of people and causing a ton of terrible suffering. <laughs> so let's set the stage. You're a farmer, no, 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 a blacksmith, and you love your family. You have a nice little business going in town. Only problem is, for the last five years, every single day, you've woken up with a huge toothache. And sure, today it's not fun to have a toothache, but it's a whole different world of pain when there are no drugs you can take for pain and no medicine or procedures to ever help you get better. Plus, over the years, it's gone from annoying to constantly distracting to mind-bendingly awful. This toothache is now the bane of your entire existence. You're not sure what to do. On one hand, you know enough to know that getting your tooth pulled is dangerous and painful. Fuck, you probably know a few people who have died because they got their teeth pulled. London kept a weekly bill of mortality. During the Middle Ages, deaths due to subsequent infections after getting your tooth pulled was always in the top 10 causes of fatality. And on the week of August 15, 1665, teeth came in at number five, causing 5,568 deaths. 5,568 deaths in a week because of teeth. But on the other hand, this pain is practically killing you already. Every time you hammer down on your anvil, every time you take a bite or even just a step, the pain reverberates throughout your body. You don't know how much longer you can keep on going like this. And now, keeping all this in mind, let's learn about the con. One Saturday, and remember, there was no internet, so you really care about this? The carnival comes to town! Holy shit, this is the best thing to happen since you went to London and got to see a bunch of dogs attack that bear stuck in the pit! You and your family are definitely going. First there's a juggler, then a man with a monkey, then a tumbling routine with hoops, and now it's time for the headliner. Drums and trumpets play, the crowd is getting hyped, and... A dentist walks onto the stage! Holy shit, a dentist! He's like, hello, is anyone here in tooth pain? And you're thinking to yourself, well, I am, but you don't want to say anything, you know, what's this guy's deal anyway? Finally, someone else in the crowd says, me? And runs up on stage. The dentist flexes, says that he's discovered a way to completely painlessly pull teeth safely, and then he reaches into the man's mouth and very easily pulls out his tooth. The man who hasn't screamed or made any uncomfortable noise at all stands up shocked. Wow, he says, that didn't hurt at all. My tooth problems are solved. The dentist takes a bow, says thank you to the volunteer, and gives a speech. You see, he isn't an ordinary dentist, a no-no. He's the best in the land, a genius healer who has found a way to pull teeth safely, quickly, and most importantly, he'll guarantee it won't cause any pain. Then he asks again, is anyone here in tooth pain? You're thinking to yourself, this, this is it. This might be my only chance. I mean, who knows when the dentist slash carnival will be in town again and this guy has the cure. So this time your hand shoots right up along with a bunch of other hands and one by one you are brought on stage. Of course, the difference between you and the previous person is that you aren't a plant the dentist hired to stage a fake tooth removal with. The first person on stage never actually needed a tooth removed. He already had somebody else's tooth primed and ready with a bit of blood on it loose in his mouth by the time he was raising his hand. And of course, you won't realize this until your tooth is ripped from your jaw with no loosening, no painkillers, no nothing on stage in front of all those people. And those drums and trumpets, they're not there by coincidence. They're there to drown out your screams so that the line of people waiting for the miracle cure, not to mention the crowd, don't realize what's going on. As soon as the show is over, the dentist and his carnival will pack up and move to the next town, and you'll be left with about a 50-50 chance of survival. This system of quacks, con artists, charlatans, whatever you want to call them, just proliferated throughout Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. The only other option was a barber surgeon, which we'll get into in a minute, or you could buy a placebo elixir or a potion if you didn't actually want to get your tooth pulled. There were doctors around who, you know, were still medieval ages doctors, so pretty useless but better than nothing, but good luck getting them to help you with teeth problems. 
in between the fall of Rome and the end of the Middle Ages, doctors basically just shrugged their shoulders and said, nah, to doing anything with teeth. Even in the 1500s, professors of medicine would give advice to doctors saying that they should just leave dentistry to the con artists because it always led to unpleasant accidents like bleeding out, horribly ripped apart gums, broken jaws, and my personal least favorite, part of the jawbone remaining attached to the tooth even after it was ripped out, resulting in, well, you can imagine. Some of them even acknowledged that while they still may be con artists and liars, that at least the charlatans did rack up a lot of experience ripping out teeth, so they were actually better than the doctors themselves at that procedure. And now, back to my hope piece. Humans need to have hope and believe they can solve problems, and without those things, we enter into some pretty murky and scary waters. These medieval doctors were inventing the field of medicine, and without any hope that they could solve dental problems, they just stopped working on them. But people were still experiencing dental problems, so they still needed to have hope that they could improve. And this combo of experts can't see a pathway where this gets better, so I'm going to just put my head in the sand, combined with, while well, my shit is still fucked up and I need to believe it can get better, so I'll start to look for other solutions, creates the perfect conditions for con artists to thrive. And thrive they did. London became the ultimate hub for them. People came from all over to get rich through scamming. I mean, it was so popular that it became an entire career pathway. One con artist doctor, William Salmon, started his career as an apprentice to a mountebank, which is of course, a dentist that rides a horse and pulls out teeth from horseback amongst other reasons so that he can ride away quickly after the deed is done. He started out as a zany, learning how to tumble and vault, do magic tricks juggling, then moving on to subconjuring astrology, telling fortunes, and of course, learning how to speak publicly all about his leader, the beloved horseback dentist, and how great he was. After all that, finally, maybe one day, if you're really good, then you would graduate to dentist and become the leader of your own pack of con artists. And I know this is obviously a terrible system, but I do think it's hilarious that the career path to dentist was basically carnival tricks and then eventually blam, you're a dentist. Like, I wish there was still a remnant of that today. Like dental school just had one mandatory juggling class there was no way out of. London wasn't the only quack hub. In Paris, the Pont Neuf Bridge was where you'd go to get your mystical remedies. No matter where you were, there were quacks to take your money and tell you it would all be fine. And with this being such a ubiquitous part of the culture, naturally it started to bleed into other aspects of the culture. First of all, language. The word charlatan originated from the Italian charlatano, which means one who sells salts and other drugs in public places, pulls teeth, and exhibits tricks. The term quack has a few different possible origins. The Dutch words quab and solver becomes the term quack solver, which means one who sells wart solves, and the German word quicksilver references mercury, which was also a popular cure-all. Or the word might just come from meaningless quacking, like quacking ducks, but even the dictionaries that say that still have a footnote that says the word originally meant a mountebank who sold salves and eye lotions at county fairs. Dentists also made their way into artwork of the era. Here's an engraving done in 1523 by Lucas van Leyden, a Dutch artist, that shows a dentist doing a tooth pulling, and as if that wasn't bad enough, the patient is also being pickpocketed at the same time his tooth is being ripped out. Here's a painting called The Tooth Puller by another Dutch artist, Jan Steen, where a whole group of people gather to watch a tooth pulling. Here's another one where again, the patient is being robbed while they're distracted. And here's another and another and another. And I can't remember when or at what museum, but at some point in childhood, I saw an exhibit that was just medieval dentist paintings, and I found it absolutely fascinating. That was definitely my OG inspiration for this video, so thank you to whichever museum that was. Basically, people knew these guys were scammers, but that didn't stop them from being really successful. Teeth problems made people desperate, and that was that. Another fun fact about these con artists, sometimes they just couldn't pull a tooth, you know, the grip wasn't right, or they pulled as hard as they could and it wouldn't budge. And when that happened, they'd be like, okay, so I've investigated the tooth you want to be pulled, and it's actually an eye tooth, so we can't take it out. The concept of an eye tooth was widespread because people believed that the teeth and the eyes were interconnected and that pulling some teeth would instantly make you go blind. 
So again, we found a way to make it seem like everything's taken care of. You know, it's not that we can't pull this tooth. It's just that you really wouldn't want me to because you'd go blind immediately. Meanwhile, on the non-con artist side of things, various guilds were forming that helped slowly define the roles that existed in the medical community. In 1210 in Paris, the Guild of Barbers was founded, but almost immediately they started to have internal fights, separating into the surgeons of the long robe, who did more surgery than barbering, and surgeons of the short robe, who did more barbering than surgery. Both groups did bloodletting and tooth pulling, and surgeons of the long robe considered themselves superior to their short robed counterparts, and eventually got a law passed that before short robed surgeons could do surgery, they had to be approved by a long robe surgeon. In England in 1540, Henry VIII unified barbers and surgeons, which also made it a rule that only people in the official group called the Masters and Governors of the Mystery and Caminolite of Barbers and Surgeons of London could do haircuts, shave, surgery, and bloodletting, but it also explicitly said that anyone in the group, or not, could pull teeth. The same thing happened in England as it happened in France. Eventually the surgeons were like, we're better than the barbers, we don't want to be grouped with them anymore. And by 1745, they were broken up into three different groups. And while Europe was at a dental standstill during the Middle Ages, a Persian physician, Raziz, was making some steps, baby steps, towards progress, which are considered the first advancements in the dental field after the fall of Rome. Raziz wrote a whole thing just talking smack about the con artists that were everywhere, saying, there are so many little arts by mountebanks and pretenders to psychic that an entire treatise would not contain them. Burn! Not an entire treatise! Did you hear that, con artist? There was also a Syrian remedy that allowed you to remove teeth without much blood, which was important to them for religious reasons, where you would pour acid onto dirt and then put the seething dirt onto gums and just dissolve them so you could take the tooth out real easy. And just a note from the author here, a lot of things made me cringe throughout the research and making of this video, but this is hands down the worst one for me. Just the thought of acid burning away all the flesh around your teeth so that you can just pop it out while you're fully awake, no words. And some fun facts before we move on from the Middle Ages. First of all, just because your local neighborhood barber surgeon wasn't a con artist, didn't mean that he didn't use flashy advertising techniques. If you were a barber surgeon and you had a little shop in town, your window display would be one thing and one thing only. Buckets of fresh blood. Yep, that was the equivalent of your local bus stop bench ad just setting up pails of blood for people to come stare at. Which, to be fair, I can't really imagine myself seeing a bucket of blood and not staring into it. So you win the IRL clickbait awards, old timey dentists. Doing this was so popular that it had to be banned in 1307, but obviously it wasn't that effective because more ordinances came out in 1566 and 1605, just saying the same thing as the original. Stop showing off buckets of blood. The traveling con artists also had a very distinct look and their biggest fashion statement, which became wildly popular for all types of dentists for hundreds of years, was to wear a necklace made of human teeth to show off how many they had pulled. Sometimes they combined the best of both worlds and had a bucket or buckets of teeth. This is also the same era barbers got their classic pole from. Their original pole had a brass wash basin at the top that represented the container leeches were kept in, and it also had a wash basin at the bottom that represented the basin that blood dripped into during bloodletting. The pole itself represents a particular staff that patients would hold on to during bloodletting. Patients held on to this staff for a couple of reasons. One was to make sure the blood flowed smoothly into the basin below, and the other was to steady yourself as you got woozy from losing so much blood. But you know, to be fair, how else were the barber surgeons going to get those buckets of blood to draw in more customers? The poles were thought to be painted red so that they didn't disturb people when blood started pouring down them. So that's the red in the poles. And then the white represents the bandages the patients got after the bloodletting was over. As for home tooth care, well, you'd still most likely have access to toothpicks and the late middle ages can take credit for the first modern toothbrush that we're aware of. Sir Ralph Verney was an English baronet and politician who was exiled and spent some of his exiling in France. In 1649, he got a letter from an English friend who asked him to send him the 
little brushes for making clean of the teeth, most covered with silver and some few with gold. However, they did not catch on. One of the most important historical dictionaries, Samuel Johnson's 1755 work, had no word for toothbrush, and they were only for the very rich until partway through the Industrial Revolution when they became easier to manufacture. But like all time periods, the Middle Ages had to come to an end, thank God. With the 1440 invention of the printing press, all sorts of information could be easily mass produced and transported, including dental texts. Then a couple hundred years later in 1683, the microscope is invented and people are absolutely gobsmacked at the number of animacules digging around the teeth, the Black Plague was mostly cleared up, and people were ready for the Renaissance. This dude, Paralsis, invents the word tartar, which is named after the sediment that builds up on wine casks. The word dentist started being used, which originated as dentista and was written by a French guy, literally Guy del Chaliac. And even Leonardo da Vinci helped build some tooth knowledge with these awesome cross sections of a skull. All of this progress meant a couple of things. The first and most exciting to me is that people were finally starting to accept that the toothworm was a lie. And oh yeah, throughout all of this, all of the Middle Ages and hundreds of years into the Renaissance and still throughout the entire world, the toothworm was still thought of as the reason for all toothaches and disease. All of those placebo tinctures and remedies that con artists would sell you, those were to kill the toothworm or deal with the toothworm in some way. And I know it goes without saying, but again, there has never been a single toothworm. All of this lie that is even more thousands of years old than it had been when I previously mentioned it, and it was already thousands of years old then, has been based on zero evidence of any kind ever. Now, don't get me wrong, there were individuals that knew it was a hoax and wrote about the toothworm lie before this. This guy in the 13th century, Jamal al-Din Abd al-Rahim al-Jabari, wrote The Book of Charlatans, which is basically his era's version of breaking the magician's code. He was most likely a reformed charlatan who then wrote down every scam he knew of, mostly the ones happening in Egypt and Syria. He wrote that some tricksters would make cakes and then put real worms in them, and then during dental procedures be like, uh, by the way, an important part of this procedure is that you put this cake in your mouth and let it sit there until it gets soft. <laughs> and then when it did get soft, they would pull out the tooth worms. <laughs> He also wrote that in China, charlatan dentists would hide maggots and hollowed out dental tools. And then, you know, when they had their hands and tools in their patients' mouths, they'd open up the tools and be like, oh, well, don't you know, the problem is tooth worms. Al Jabari is also the one who explained why it had always been so popular to get rid of tooth worms by burning henbane seeds because burning them revealed something that looked like it could be worms. And throughout my research, henbane seeds kept coming up so many cultures, so many remedies, so many fake toothworm lies where henbane was referenced. And so I thought to myself, I gotta get my eyes on some henbane seeds. And the second thing the Renaissance primed the world for was Pierre Fichard, who is considered to be the father of modern dentistry. Why? Honestly, it's kind of hard to tell. To me, it just felt like I was reading about all these teeth people and then it was just announced, by the way, this one's the father of modern dentistry. But Let's get into Pierre and why he got that title. Pierre was, like everyone I've mentioned so far, and myself included, a weirdo. He said that childhood never distracted me from surgery, to which I was destined from my youth. So we all know he had chosen one energy, and then after his education, he became one of the top dentists in Paris. The thing I like best about Pierre is that he was into the emotional connection we have to teeth, just like me. He wrote, the teeth in the natural condition are the most polished and the hardest of all the bones in the human body, but at the same time, they are the most subject to diseases which cause acute pain and sometimes become very dangerous. He said that teeth problems were a sad experience that we all have and felt really bad that so many people would just go to the closest place available to get a tooth pulled for something that seemed routine, but in fact was extremely dangerous. The big thing that got Pierre famous was his 1728 book called The Surgeon Dentista, or The Surgeon Dentist. He had 19 of his peers check his work and give input, which is the backbone of all scientific progress. 
letting other educated and expert minds give their opinion about the validity of your claims. And this book just blew up. It became the go-to book about dentistry for the entire 18th century and gave much needed authority to the field. You know what? Peer review is a big deal. I'll give him father of dentistry just for that. He said directly in his book that he blamed other doctors and particularly surgeons for the world's lack of dental care. He said that surgeons had abandoned this part of medicine and because of this negligence, it allowed people without theory or experience to degrade the practice, cause care to be haphazard and without principles or method. And not that we don't have enough examples of that at this point, but one case Pierre lays out is of this guy who wanted a canine removed. And when he went to the dentist, the dentist picked up a stone, started hammering on it to get it out. And then once they couldn't see it anymore, was like, oh, you must have swallowed it. Goodbye. And then it wasn't until later when this guy noticed a little hard tumor in his cheek, which of course was the tooth hammered straight through the roof of his mouth and lodged in his face. And then that guy had to have surgery to remove the cheek tooth. And remember, there is no anesthetic at this point. He also includes a story about how some dentists didn't even know that kids have a different set of teeth. And they were so confused when they would pull one and find a new tooth growing underneath that then they would just go ahead and pull the second one too. Fun! Pierre also described in detail the tools he used, and he recommended that you gargle your mouth with pee whenever you have a toothache. You know, it's hard to get everything right. And speaking of not getting everything right, let's check in with our old friend who has never existed, the tooth worm. Like I mentioned earlier, even as early as the 13th century, people were starting to call out the tooth worm for being a lie slash scam. But even 500 years later, when Pierre was publishing the first major book on dentistry, he was still halfway holding on to the tooth worm. Although he wouldn't say that it definitely existed, he did say that insects could potentially fly into your mouth and hatch larvae, and that if the larva hatched, it could cause tooth pain. You know, hey, if you're making even partial sense in the 1700s, I'll give it to you. In 1757, tooth worms got another important downgrade. A pastor, Jacob Schaefer, wrote an expose called The Fancy Worms and Teeth, which, you know, just said they're fake. Tooth worms, of course, didn't die out overnight. It took hundreds of more years before they were primarily thought of as a lie or even better, never thought of at all. But honestly, after reading so much about how pervasive this lie is and just how easy it is for humans to believe it, I feel confident that even today, there must be people out there who were taught that this is what's going on in your teeth and they really believe that. And before we move on to our next part of history, I just wanna say, be glad you've never had to be a living tooth donor. For about 100 years, starting in 1750 in Europe and America, if you were in desperate need of two guineas, then you could show up to a dentist's office and have this truly terrible job. The patient or rich person would be the one who needed a tooth. And so on the spot, the dentist would pull out yours and then try to jam it in the mouth hole of the rich person. The first one usually wouldn't take, so they would get three or four volunteers and then go down the line until one did. And the tooth implants? They only lasted a couple of months max before falling out again. And I can think of no better way to start talking about America than inhumane and unjust social class differentials. There's no way around it. That's just one of our specialties. And it turns out that for a couple hundred years there, dentistry became one of our specialties as well. Before we dive into that though, let's check in on those continents and what they were doing dental wise before colonization. The indigenous people of North and South America didn't have large amounts of refined sugar in their diets, so rates of cavities were pretty low. The North American tribes believed that their teeth were healthy because they used tobacco and magic, which by the way is my favorite combination of anything. Like, what do you want to do Friday night? Uh, tobacco and magic? Mm-hmm. Ooh, why does it smell so good in here? Tobacco and magic. <laughs> They also had a few treatments to prevent the rare toothache that did happen, all of which were about as useful as their counterparts across the world. 
if you spat when you saw a shooting star, it was believed that you could save a tooth from falling out. And if you caught a green snake, stretched it horizontally, moved it seven times back and forth, and then turned it loose, and then didn't eat salty food for four days, you could keep a tooth healthy for life. Hell yeah. When those methods failed and a tooth did need to be pulled, they actually had a pretty good pain management alternative compared to the rest of the world, the prickly ash tree. You would take a thorn from this tree, poke it into your gums near the painful tooth, and then after a few minutes, you'd be numb and relatively prepared for extraction. Down in Central and South America, they made their healthy teeth into the most logical thing I can think of, fashion statements that ancient Mayans would drill into teeth so that they could adorn them with beautiful jewels like turquoise, jadeite, hematite, and more. This was more often done to men and was just done for aesthetic reasons. If bejeweling your teeth wasn't for you, there were plenty of other tooth beautification measures available. You could file your teeth in various shapes, file cross hatches in the front, or just dye your teeth red or black. And now let's head back to the early American colonies where all of a sudden newspapers and teeth became extremely interwoven. And reading through the newspaper articles, quotes, and rivalries of the time, the thing that really became apparent is that these old timey papers basically functioned like Twitter. Turns out there was always the need to drag people and generally call them out, and a great way to do that in the 1700s was via ads in your local newspaper. In fact, the very first case that helped pave the way for freedom of the press in the colonies involved teeth and shit talking. The editor of the New York Weekly Journal, this guy John Peter Zanger, basically just used the magazine to talk shit about the British and to try to convince people to hate them. So he started taking shots at the obviously British governor of New York, William Cosby. Amongst other things, Zanger wrote that the governor had an unclean mouth and loathsome fake teeth. The governor was so mad that he threw the newspaper editor into jail for a seditious libel. However, Alexander Hamilton wrote up from Philadelphia to defend Zanger and said the article was only liable if it was false, so the governor had to prove that he didn't have a dirty mouth and gross fake teeth. The governor's teeth must have been pretty bad because he was unable to achieve the burden of proof and the newspaper editor was released and acquitted. Go freedom of the press! Most of the time, however, tooth articles didn't make it all the way to the courts, and the most common tooth-related articles were advertisements. And if you think back to before board certifications, before any government regulations, these ads and whatever you could find out about the dentist's reputation were the only pieces of information you'd have as a possible consumer. In 1766, this British dentist, Robert Woofendale, came from London to New York and placed this ad in the New York Mercury. Robert Woofendale, surgeon dentist, lately arrived from London, who was instructed by Thomas Birdmore, Esquire, operator for the teeth to his present Britannic Majesty, begs leave to inform the public that he performs all operations upon the teeth, gums, sockets, and palate without pain or the least convenience. Sounds pretty good, right? Too bad it's all lies, because seven years later in 1773, the guy Woofendale said taught him publishes an ad in England's York Current that was like, hey, I did not teach that guy. Or as he puts it, Mr. Birdmore wishes not to prejudice this young man, but cannot suffer the sanction of his name to be disingenuously imposed upon them. It's basically the 1700s version of saying you went to Harvard to get a job and then having Harvard find out and do a paid Facebook ad campaign against you saying, this person definitely didn't go to Harvard. Another update of the times is that barber surgeons were being replaced by wig makers who also practiced dentistry or wig maker and hairdresser and also an operator for the teeth as they advertise themselves in these papers. To me, this seems even less relevant than someone who's cutting hair and pulling teeth. Like wig making is now not even dealing with someone's actual body part. It's like sculpture or an art or something, but to each their own. 
And while we're talking about the American colonies, it's the perfect time to reveal to you that one of our very own founding fathers was in fact a dentist. Paul Revere, who we are aware of because Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote a poem about him in 1860, in addition to being a midnight writer and a silversmith, was also a dentist. And he entered the scene in the best way you could back then by getting a fancy dentist to write a newspaper ad about how good you were. This guy, John Baker, was the first English trained dentist that came over to practice dentistry in the colonies. He treated everyone fancy who needed dental help, including George Washington, and he had a great reputation. Then, when the fancy dentist was getting ready to move to New York from Boston, he naturally needed to recommend someone for all his clients to go to. He was like, guys, I trained Paul Revere, and if you have any problems, go straight to him. He's a real respectable dude and knows what he's doing. A few years later, Paul Revere picked up yet another claim to fame by being what is believed to be the first person to identify a dead body by its teeth in the Americas. There was an honored general who had been killed in the Battle of Bunker Hill and left in an unmarked grave with the other deceased. A year later, when the colonies controlled the bunker again, they dug up the bodies but didn't know which one the general was. Thank goodness, just two years before the general had died, Paul Revere actually made a bridge with two fake teeth made of hippo ivory for him and went to the bunker to make a positive identification. CSI American Revolution. And speaking of founding fathers, there's no way I can cover the history of dentistry and not get into the founding father with the saddest two story, George Washington. In short, George Washington's teeth were fucked. By the time he was 22, his teeth had started to fall out, which was bad even for his day. About one tooth a year was removed after that, and the pain and suffering never stopped. By age 28, he was said to keep his mouth closed as much as possible and was using partial dentures by his early 40s. Out of everyone living during this time, Washington probably had the best resources available to him, and even those were barely any help. He would order a ton of dental supplies regularly, including dozens and dozens of sponge toothbrushes. Every well-known dentist of the time eventually had a crack at Washington's teeth, but it kind of didn't matter. The war even sunk into Washington's dental problems. In what's gotta be one of the most low-stakes spy events ever, one of his requests for dental supplies was intercepted by the British and never reached the dentist meant for it. George Washington never had wooden teeth, wood just wasn't used for dentures, but he did have dentures made from a ton of other materials. The most popular material was hippopotamus teeth, which was rebranded as seahorse teeth so that people felt classy. He also had dentures made from walrus tusk, cow teeth, elephant tusk, elk teeth, and lead. Also, the dentures that he was using were really, really bad. They were horribly uncomfortable. Spiral springs would jam into the sides of your mouth to keep them in place because there were no molds for your actual mouth like today. Instead, dentists would just kind of look at your mouth and eyeball what size they thought the dentures should be. So how comfortable could they have been? Uh, not at all. And because of this, it was considered standard practice to remove your dentures for eating, but Washington didn't want to suffer that indignity, so he made it a practice to keep his on, which made him experience melancholy, anxiety, and extreme sensibility when he was hosting dinners. By the time he was president, he was having to spend full days relaxing at home because his teeth were bothering him so much. In 1796, his last natural tooth was removed, completely removing his ability to chew. He had to grip his lips all day to stop the dentures from coming out, and a visitor in 1790 wrote, his mouth was like no other I ever saw. The lips firm and the under jaw seemed to grasp the upper with force, as if the muscles were in full action when he sat still. George Washington was generally known as being very vain, and this must have been absolutely crushing to him. He even started talking publicly less because of it. Zipping along through time, the next major technological breakthrough was a big one. It's kind of the big one. Anesthetic. Nitrous oxide or laughing gas was the first anesthetic to be discovered and at first was just used for getting high. <laughs> the scientist that popularized the technique was named Humphrey Davy 
and he would travel around rich people's social circles like how you see photo booths at big parties and weddings today. Except instead of holding up a silly mustache, you inhaled nitrous and got super fucked up. This lasted for decades. The first NO2 experiments done by Davy were in 1799, and it wasn't until 1844 when Horace Wells, a dentist and doctor, was at one of these laughing gas exhibitions and saw someone high on gas jumping about and smashing up benches as well as his own legs. This guy's legs were all bloody, but he didn't feel any pain, and Horace Wells had his light bulb moment. Wells set up a big demonstration at Boston General Hospital, and even though it failed because of a dosing misstep, the scientific community was generally alerted to this as an option. Within a few years, people were experimenting with ether and chloroform, and by the end of the 1800s, the medical profession finally had a way to painlessly operate on people, opening up countless new procedures that could be tried. And as all the anesthetic progress was being made during the 1800s, dentists themselves were also undergoing an important change, legitimization. In the beginning of the 1800s, a split happened. The more legit dentists started putting down roots, they stopped traveling from town to town and started opening offices. And the less legit, more con arty dentists stayed traveling so they could escape afterwards, which meant they were still using newspaper ads to alert the public of where they currently were. But what technically separated the legit dentists from the con artists? Solving that problem would take a lot of changes and a lot more organization. In the early 1800s, you could just buy a dental degree for anywhere from $5 to $20. There were diploma mills from places like Central University of Medicine or Science of Jersey City. There was also a difference in skill sets developing. The properly educated dentists could clean teeth, extract teeth, make artificial teeth, as well as transplant teeth. And the old school dentists only knew how to pull teeth and do tooth scraping. Educated dentists also continued to realize that the entire field of dentistry was still being held back by the snobbish opinions that surgeons and other medical professionals had, which were shared by the public. In the 1840s in the English journal The Forceps, a surgeon wrote, a pure surgeon can scarcely be expected to pay attention to the subject of such minor importance as the teeth or soil his aristocratic fingers by touching a key instrument. Like, damn, I don't love going to the dentist either, but soil your aristocratic fingers by touching a tooth? Like, what? No wonder it took so long for dentistry to become legitimized. Dentistry was also becoming a much more popular career choice. In 1825, there were about 100 dentists in the US, but because of the depression that happened in the 1830s, a bunch of unemployed mechanics decided that they would transition into dentistry, and by 1840, there were 1,200 dentists in the US. An American dentist, Shirdashev Spooner, was one of the leaders of the legitimization movement. He said, one thing is for certain, this profession must either rise or sink. He basically explained that there were so many incompetent people, so many uneducated con artists, that if they were allowed to continue, that the legitimate dentists would quit and find other careers. He thought everyone should be required to be an apprentice and pass an exam given by a board of competent dentists before they were allowed to practice dentistry. Spoiler alert, but you know, we did eventually do this, thank God. 1839 is the year organized dentistry was formed. In that year, America published its first dental book, as well as its first dental journal, and only a year later, in 1840, the world's first dentistry college, Baltimore College of Dental Surgery, was opened. This formal dental education structure helped America be the world's dental leader in the upcoming years. It took a couple decades before they could achieve their goal of preventing unqualified dentists from practicing, but in 1859, the American Dental Association, or ADA, formed. Now organized, those dentists pressured their individual states to pass laws ensuring that only qualified dentists could practice. And besides the thrilling tale of how dentists organize themselves, what else was happening in American dentistry in the 1800s? Well, during the Civil War, in order to rip open the paper envelopes full of gunpowder, you had to have at least two opposing front teeth. So naturally, some people ripped out all their opposing front teeth to avoid becoming a soldier. 
black dentists have been reported as early as 1765 with Peter Hawkins of Richmond, Virginia, a mountebank. And in 1792, a slave in South Carolina named Caesar was freed after providing dental and medical cures and given an annual salary of $100 by the state. Of course, black people needed to be their own dentists because white dentists refused to treat them. So by 1840, 10% of dentists in America were black. Harvard Dental School graduated a black dentist in their first class ever of just six dentists. And in 1881, the Howard University College of Dentistry was founded, but because of Jim Crow and continued racism, the amount of black dentists began to plateau and then decline. By 1910, less than 2% of America's dentists were black. Obviously women were being crushed as well. The first women dentists were all women who were married to dentists and then they ended up learning the tricks of the trade despite of course them not having the constitution or dexterity needed. Lucy Hobbs Taylor was the first woman to get a degree in dentistry in 1866. She was rejected twice for being a woman, which really just makes me ask, what happened that third time? Were they like, okay, it's 1866 now. We're slightly less sexist than we were in 1865 and 1864. <laughs> the first black woman to get a dentistry degree was Ida Gray in 1880, but the same thing happened to women as black people. There was a peak in the late 1800s and then a lessening by the 1900s. Even when women were allowed to practice dentistry, they were still stuck in their time period. Here's an article responding to the Ohio College of Dental Surgery, which had decided to bring more women into their school. We heartily second the school's efforts. We almost imagine ourselves seated in the chair of torture, dreaded now no more. By our side, a beautiful lady with sweet breath and glowing cheek, her delicate arm encircling our head, our cheek resting against a bosom still more soft, looking up into her eyes, so tender in their gaze, they take away all dread, and in their sympathy even defy the pain itself. With such a dentist, we would want our teeth examined every 24 hours. Or this poem entitled, To a Lady Dentist, Lady Dentist, fair to see, Are the forceps held by thee? Lest those pretty lips should pout, You may pull my eye tooth out. I'm regardless of the pangs, When thy hand extracts the fangs. Fun! But don't worry, sexism aside, most of the public still had opinions about dentists that I'm sure you'll recognize, like this Chicago Herald article. The dental tools are simply copies in miniature of articles used in the Spanish Inquisition and on refractory prisoners in the Tower of London. There are monkey wrenches, gouges, cleavers, drills, daggers, little crowbars, and long wire feelers with prehensile palpating tips that can reach down through the roots of a throbbing tooth and fish up a yell from your inner consciousness. When a painstaking dentist cannot hurt you with the cold steel, he lights up a small alcohol lamp and heats one of his little spades red hot and hovers over you with an expectant smile. Then he deftly inserts this into your mouth and when you give a yell he says, does that hurt? Next up we have a true clash between eras, so buckle up for the story of Painless Parker, one of the last great con artist dentists who accidentally helped out modern dentistry. Basically, Painless Parker was a guy who loved selling shit and making money. And the thing he figured out how to sell and make money off of was dentistry. Born in 1872, his childhood was spent working as a peddler, but he knew he wanted to demand people's respect. His idea about how to get that respect formed early when he decided that he wanted to go into medicine and already you can hear his salesman thought process taking over. It seemed to me that all the doctors did was stroll around in white coats with great dignity and look cool. It didn't appear that they had to work very hard. They just looked scholarly and mysterious and prescribed sales. It looked like a good life. I knew I could look as mysterious and all knowing as the next guy if I had one of those white coats. Like, great, okay, not even going to pretend that healing people was on your priority list. Cool, cool. <laughs> when he told his mom he wanted to go into medicine, she freaked out because she was a Christian scientist. So he switched paths to phrenology. Yes, that racist skull measuring thing. For whatever reason, after he met with a phrenologist, they told him he'd be good at dentistry and off Painless Parker went. 
Of course, he couldn't make it too long without getting a scheme going. So as soon as he was in dentistry school, he started spending his nights going door to door selling dental cures. He used the same type of speech that he used during his experience as a peddler and replaced all the specifics with dentistry. Practicing dentistry before you've graduated was super illegal, so he was expelled, but not discouraged. He continued working illegally until he was able to apply and graduate from another dental school only a couple years later, even though it's reported that he only graduated because he begged the dean so badly. And right after he graduated from dental school was really the only time Painless tried to go straight. He set up an office and for three months tried to be an ethical dentist. However, when at the end of his three months he had only made 75 cents, Painless had had enough. Because there had been such a problem with fraud and false advertising, dentists had gotten together and decided that it should be illegal for any dentist to do any advertising. This was mostly a way to block the traveling dentists, which tended to be the con artist dentists, because they relied so heavily on newspaper ads. But that didn't scare Painless. He wrote a new speech, this time based on the hellfire and brimstone sermons that he had heard at church, and joined up with the Kickapoo Medicine Company Traveling Medicine Show, a truly gross 1800s version of the Middle Ages shows that was half snake oil salesman, con artists, and half exploited indigenous people. The indigenous people performed in between sales pitches and were also there as props because of the stereotype that they inherently understood natural medicine. Parker fit right in. He charged 50 cents per tooth removed and offered a $5 reward if the patient felt pain. Of course, Parker claimed that he had invented cocaine and then shot up patients' mouths beforehand so they'd be numb, and before long he was making 50 bucks a day and shooting out quotes like this. They needed dentistry worse than I needed money, if such a thing was possible. I took 33 teeth out of 12 patients and nobody screamed. Why? I'll never know. I ran out of hydrocaine on the seventh patient. Soon he was ready to expand out on his own and hired William Beebe, who had also been P.T. Barnum's publicist. Beebe started a publicity blitz, buying billboards, magazine and newspaper ads, sandwich boards, and on and on. Parker started his own show that included singers, acrobats, jugglers and magicians, dancers, musicians, and more. His show would start with a parade where Painless Parker was the grand finale. He'd ride in an open carriage wearing a top hat and throw nickels and dimes out to the crowd. He also wore a necklace with 357 teeth, all from a single day of work. These stunts didn't go unnoticed and Parker was busted regularly and constantly hit with fraud and malpractice lawsuits. There was even a law passed forcing people to practice medicine under their legal name, so he legally changed his first name to Painless. When he was 34, he decided to move to California to escape his East Coast reputation and to start building a dentist office empire, and advertised with blimps and airplanes until it peaked in 1913 when he bought a circus so that the animals and acrobats could perform at the openings of his new offices. Painless died in 1952, and even though he couldn't have been more hated when he was alive, in a weird way he gained some respect from the community post-mortem. One, because he was obsessed with making as much money as possible, all of his advertising and snake oil selling actually managed to really increase the public's awareness of dental hygiene. Plus, it is legal for dentists to advertise now, so even though he did it in the least tasteful way possible, he did really show all of dentistry the power of advertising. And now we enter the time in history when dentists had a mortal enemy, and that mortal enemy was the Goodyear Company. So, after thousands of years, finally, there was a solution to dentures, and that solution was vulcanized rubber. No longer would you have to have metal springs literally screw into your flesh. No longer would dentures be carved from porcelain and then your mouth forced to hold it all together. Vulcanized rubber, or vulcanite, was moldable, soft to the mouth, inexpensive, and you can jam fake teeth in there real easy. Vaultonite was patented by Goodyear in 1844, and dentists just kind of quietly used it until 1861, when the patent expired and they all breathed a collective sigh of relief. Except a random dentist in Boston had been trying this whole time to get a patent just for the vulcanization of rubber for dentists. And even though he had been rejected a bunch of times, in 1862, for some reason, they granted to him, and then he immediately transfers that patent back to Goodyear, who had been pressuring the dentist to keep applying. And now we meet the main character of this story, Josiah Bacon, Goodyear employee of the fucking year. 
This spiteful fuck has had this scheme in his head the whole time and is like, finally, and starts to charge every dentist who makes their own vulcanized rubber for dentures anywhere from $25 to $100 a year, plus $2 for each denture made. This is way more than the average patient can afford, way more than the dentist can pay, and after so long, they've finally gotten this perfect material, so they just kind of keep making the dentures without paying. And that's when the lawsuits begin. Josiah sues all of the top dentists, starts winning, and then goes back to sue again and again. The dentists try to organize and raise funds, but they can't keep up. Some dentists end up paying the fee, some don't, and they keep getting sued. Bacon then sets up spies in every city and paid them to hunt down the dentists not paying the fee. He even specialized in hiring hot young women to be the spies so that no one would suspect them. In 1877, it goes all the way to the Supreme Court and Bacon wins, making him even more emboldened. He starts to get vindictive. There was this one dentist, Samuel Chalfont, who had been sued twice before and would just pick up and move instead of paying the licensing fees. After the second time, he moved all the way to San Francisco to avoid Bacon and the lawsuits. So of course, Bacon decides he has to hunt him down. He takes a lawsuit road trip, filing all the way from Boston to San Francisco. When Bacon gets to San Francisco, he finds Chalfont. Chalfont is immediately found guilty of patent infringement for the third time. And then he's so mad, he's like, my dentistry practice has been totally ruined over this, that the next day he tracks down Bacon in his hotel room and shoots him dead. Imagine being murdered over dental rubber. Like, was it worth it, Bacon? Was it worth it for fucking Goodyear patents? <laughs> And after Bacon's murder, Goodyear backed the fuck off on the lawsuits. In 1881, the patent expired and the company did not seek an extension. And finally, finally, dentures, the life-changing technology that 10% of the population needed became affordable enough for the common person to afford. Besides lawsuits, the 1800s were also a really great time to experiment with drugs. And that experimenting wasn't just for adults, they also brought it straight to babies. <laughs> so, babies teething, not fun for anyone, right? Their teeth are bursting through their gums and they cry extra. Well, in the 1800s, they thought teething was a full-blown disease that needed to be stopped. Everyone was convinced it wasn't just an annoying series of screams, but a dangerous time in a child's life that needed to be closely regulated. To help, they would actually force open a baby's mouth and then cut the gums so that the teeth were exposed. But if that seemed kind of extra, you could just drug your baby. This Dr. Godry's general cordial was super popular as well as Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup. These medicines were just cocktails of morphine, alcohol, opium, etc. But if you've ever felt bad at yourself for how annoyed you were at a baby, give yourself a pat on the back for not just getting it so high that it shut the fuck up. And with that, we are in the 1900s, baby, the century when dentistry finally became less terrifying. <laughs> there was a touch and go period where electricity was installed in dental offices. People were justifiably scared that something would go wrong in a room with so much metal equipment. But more exciting was this cool new technology that let you see inside your own body. So x-rays. There's a reason your dental hygienist puts that lead bib on you and leaves the room, but the inventors of x-rays had to find that out firsthand with their own hands. Obviously, when x-rays first came out, they were exciting as shit. Like, sit still for a couple minutes and get a cool-ass picture like this? No brainer. They got popular, just like nitrous and ether parties had a few decades before, and this dentist Charles Kells started taking pictures of teeth. And let's be real, almost everyone I've mentioned in this video is probably a huge racist, but we have definitive proof that Charles Kells was a piece of shit racist who joined the White League at 17 and in his autobiography made sure to say that he always regretted missing the day that his friends went to go beat up and destroy the lives of Reconstructionist officials. Anyway, this dude Kells is one of what is known as the X-ray martyrs. The way x-rays were set up, the person taking the picture would still have one of their hands exposed to the rays. And you can imagine what happens next. First, nothing. You know, it's just some small burns right at the beginning. They went away. Probably nothing to look into. Probably good. <laughs> then, years later, his left hand had become covered in growths. 
Kells ended up having over 10 surgeries on his hand, losing bits of his fingers each time. A cancerous ulcer then appeared, and he had ultraviolet radiation as a treatment, which of course made it worse, then lost more of his hand and eventually his whole arm. The pain didn't stop, so eventually Kells blew his own brain out and left this as his suicide note. Friends, I beseech you, beware of the ultraviolet ray. And now, after many, many minutes of dental history, let's talk about fluoride. So, Big Brother putting chemicals in the drinking water, it's not a pleasing image, sure. But flashback to the thousands of years of human suffering of all these cavities. Flashback to the henbane seeds being all the medicine we had. Flashback to the con artists beating their drums. Flash to the slow, granular progress to when good dentures were finally invented and 10% of people got to replace their fucking porcelain hippo teeth that they had stuck in their mouth with something useful. And maybe you can start to see that why when we found a solution that decreases cavities by 35% and has no side effects, we took it. The connection between healthy teeth and fluoride was known by 1874 and compared to taking calcium for the bones. Tooth enamel is 97% fluoride and hydroxyuptite, which combines to form fluoroptite, so scientists believe that they could make teeth stronger by giving people extra fluoride. Plenty of areas naturally get enough fluoride in their water supplies, and all the people that lived in those locations were just as healthy as the non-fluoride areas. So in 1945, three different towns were selected as test groups, and instantly the amount of tooth problems started to go down. And what would a dental history video be without a segment on the tooth theory? So let's get into it. For much longer than she's been around, there have been traditions with losing teeth and thanking the appropriate animal. And the animals who have been associated with these traditions are kind of a who's who of animals with distinctive teeth. In the Cherokee culture, it's beavers. And in France, Spain, and a lot of South Asian cultures, it's mice. The story went that if one of your lost teeth was found by an animal, then the adult tooth that would grow in would have the characteristics of that animal's teeth. And because rodent teeth are sharp and always growing, like our fingernails, a mouse was often the choice. Most people think the genesis of this legend in France was a 17th century story named The Little Good Mouse, which describes a fairy who transformed herself into a mouse so she could hide under the pillow and fuck with an evil king. So a fairy has been involved for some time, as has paying children for their teeth, which goes all the way back to Norse culture in the 1200s. And now that we've gone over all of that, talked about so many facts, about so many teeth, what did I learn from making this video? Mostly that we are so lucky to be living in the era we currently are. I mean, a lot is terribly fucked up. Don't get me wrong, I don't have rose-colored glasses on about our current era, but the pure amount of human suffering caused by teeth and the fact that for thousands of years, nothing was available that helped at all. I mean, Jesus. Hot take, you know, I don't like going to the dentist. I used to absolutely hate it. It hurts, obviously, and a lot of my childhood dentists and orthodontists made me feel really bad, like I was inherently a failure for my teeth not being better. And then I couldn't afford to go to the dentist for over five years, and even though it was great in a lot of ways because I didn't have to go to the dentist that whole time, it was also really scary, especially when I was going back for that first time. You know, for years I had panicked visions about going in and being told I was on the verge of all my teeth falling out because my gum decay was so bad because I was such a failure at oral hygiene, which to be fair, I am a failure at oral hygiene. And then during the middle of researching this video, I went to the dentist and felt some of the most intense gratitude I've ever experienced my entire life. I had a really deep cavity that needed to be filled and yeah, nothing was like fun about the experience, but I was in a nice, temperature controlled, sterile white room. I got to play Star Trek on the TV on the ceiling. And after my dentist had pretty much painlessly drilled out my tooth, 
He filled it with some fancy polymer that activates when it's hit with blue light and melted permanently into my tooth and it's even a nice white tooth color. And just thinking about how in all of human history, how statistically unlikely I am to be able to have this experience, even though unfortunately, yes, you still have to be pretty privileged to get it and how I wasn't in a stone room next to a bunch of buckets of blood with a 50% chance of death after extraction made me very appreciative. Honestly, hot tip from me dentists, find some way to let your patients know how good they have it. I think the waiting room to all dentist offices should just be pictures of the carnivals and pickpockets and tooth necklaces so that you feel gratitude when you finally get to this very scary, but at least safe and equipped to help you white chair. It also made me feel really bad for dentists because the main thought going through my head as I made this video was that this relationship we have with teeth and getting them treated is just natural and inherent. And what's natural and inherent is that we fucking hate it and resent the people trying to help. Because sure, it's relatively painless compared to what it used to be, but I totally agree with that old timey English newspaper that said that dental tools are just like miniature torture devices. They're fucking scary and pointy and you never see any of the helpful work they're doing, just them disappearing from view and then the pain beginning. And who are you going to blame? Obviously, the person holding the tools. And I think our complex feelings about dentistry are so tied to the location of the teeth, you know? They're right in our heads. And even though we're aware of the fact that our entire bodies are part of ourselves, we see out of these guys, we think out of our brain. So it really, really feels like our faces are who we are. You know, this is the soul area, the only area we really need to keep our identity. And it's scary when someone's fucking with it and you don't have any control. I'm sure all those people getting their feet sawed off in the olden times weren't happy about it, but you don't see this millennia long grudge against surgeons. Once in the same group as dentists and barbers, they're now revered as the fanciest of the fancy doctors. They even made the leap to general medical insurance. I think it's also something to do with the fact that the teeth are visible. A surgeon goes in, does their work, and then ties everything back together like a rewrapped Christmas present. You know stuff was done to you internally, but it's way easier to get into an out of sight, out of mind mindset. Dentistry is the reverse. The teeth are always on display, baby. So our vanity and egos are way more involved. There's no way around it. You're being penetrated. And that involves intimacy and vulnerability. And despite all our technology, a good little dose of pain. It sucks. <laughs> and add to that fact that very few body parts are on our mind as often as teeth. All day long, my stupid tongue is gliding back and forth, reminding me of the unevenness and flaws in my smile. Every day I ask myself if I should get Invisalign to fix what two rounds of braces and countless amounts of headgear, neckgear, and retainers couldn't. And every day I say, no fucking way am I subjecting myself to years of that pain again. I haven't thought about some of my organs ever, but I never pass a day without thinking about my teeth. And even that isn't enough to make me have good dental hygiene. I can barely be bothered to clean my teeth partially good enough some of the time, so I feel like I'm constantly failing at dental hygiene, which most dentists love to point out, and then we get into this weird morality play and how we all react when we're dealing with authority figures. I have fantasies about knocking out all my teeth so I can have them all replaced with perfect dentures and stop thinking about them forever. I have nightmares about bad things happening to my teeth, and yet throughout all of that, they're also pretty boring. I think about them consistently, but never deeply. They just sit there helping me chew and besides that, being a hassle. But none of that is any dentist's fault. In fact, dentists are the only people trying to make our tooth problems better. <laughs> it's not dentist's fault that we all hate our teeth, but we sure do take it out on them. And this is where I was going to talk about how dentists have the highest suicide rate of all careers. But then I looked it up and apparently that's from some papers in the 60s that have been disputed many times by now. But it doesn't stop us from going around with a little smile on our heart saying that dentists love to kill themselves. And don't get me wrong, there are plenty of jerk dentists and I don't like them. The jerk dentist I went to early on made my hygiene habits even worse because even when I would try to improve, they would tell me I was on the brink of all my gums dissolving and my teeth being fucked up forever. 
But that's just people. There's a lot of horrible ones. These nice dentists, they deserve better. Like my dentist, Cupcake from The Bachelor. If you live in LA and need a nice dentist, go to him. And if you have watched this far and you're not related to me, then you will like this book, The Excruciating History of Dentistry by James Winbrandt. He's very funny and it's a great read. I've linked to both below. And if making this video has taught me anything, it's that human progress is slow, especially when it involves our egos and pain. So to all the nice dentists out there that are tired of being shit on, I'm sorry. I'm not gonna floss more, but I am sorry. You're doing good work. You're not a con artist. You deserve to be part of regular medical insurance and have offices in the hospital, and I see you. And good on us for sticking with science until we had this and not this.